Hello. So today for my talk entitled Human Perception and Mixed Reality, we're going to look at mixed reality from a perceptual point of view. More specifically, we're going to consider all the sensory cues that go into a compelling mixed reality experience and learn about how the various sensors, algorithms, displays, speakers, and other technologies combine to take advantage of those cues and help the user feel immersed in the content. The term mixed reality covers the spectrum of experiences from augmented to virtual reality. For today's discussion, I'm going to focus mostly on the HoloLens and its ability to embed virtual content in the real world. For instance, here we show how the HoloLens could be used to supplement a bland office with a virtual pet, a digital avatar of a coworker, and a virtual display. There are a lot of challenges to pulling off these kinds of scenarios since the juxtaposition of the real world will emphasize any errors in how the virtual overlay is presented. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to review the hardware and content considerations that go into making a compelling and convincing holographic experience. However, as we go along, I'll point out how the principles we discuss do or do not translate to purely virtual reality, where the real world is blocked off completely and only the virtual content can be seen. I'd like to use a case study to go over all the perceptual considerations in MR. Since games are often the most technologically demanding applications on a platform, we'll focus on one we created for the HoloLens called RoboRaid. However, at the end, we'll loop back to some of our successful MR enterprise applications that rely on the exact same technologies and perceptual cues. In RoboRaid, your goal is to fight off a series of angry alien robots that are invading your room. A crucial element of the experience enabled by the HoloLens is the illusion that the aliens are actually breaking through your walls. As you can imagine, this requires accurate knowledge of the locations and orientations of your walls, but there's a lot more to creating a compelling experience than just knowing where the walls are. Here's an overview video we created to explain the features of the game. Before I start the video, note that the video actually shows real gameplay. Uh, within it, the third person shots were captured using a special camera rig attached to a, a separate HoloLens, um, and the first-person shots represent the holographic frame that was visible to the viewer. Um, this video was made with the HoloLens 1 in mind, so the field of view in HoloLens 2 when you're playing the game is significantly larger. When I'm trying to explain HoloLens to people, I say it's uh, magical alien technology that we stole from, a, from an asteroid. It really feels like an alien invasion is coming into your house and you're fighting them. You kind of forget that it's not real. RoboRaid is a world's first mixed reality shooting game where you defend your home from a robot invasion. You're, you know, blending the digital world and the physical world in a way that's kind of unprecedented. We really want to get people excited about the technology and there's no better way than while having fun. Every single different room creates new challenges, new types of levels for the game. It is fundamentally aware of your space. It knows where your walls are. You know, when you're shooting at the space around you, you're shooting your walls. It's not some pre-canned level. It literally is your room. You can hear when the wall is crumbling around you. So if you hear like a cracking sound next to you or behind you, you know, you should turn around and check out what's going on. And the sound that laser makes, it's, I, every time I hear it, I, I just, I grin from ear to ear. RoboRaid is a game that will really help developers kind of see what's possible from an entertainment perspective. In a HoloLens game, the real world is part of your content. And so you don't have to fill the entire screen with stuff. Spatial audio is crazy, and with a bit of trial and error and just kind of playing around with it, you can get really quite amazing accuracy. If you know Unity, that's enough to get started building HoloLens apps. I can be in the Unity editor on my PC, and when I hit play, I see it in my HoloLens. People that have that 3D mentality, they're used to thinking about things in a spatial sense, definitely they just fit right in and they hit the ground running. We kind of think of it as this quick, simple, light, but mixed reality experience that really introduces you to everything that's different and new about HoloLens. All right, so let's consider all of the visual and audio or oral cues that go into an experience like RoboRaid. So here's a collection of some of the most critical visual and oral cues that we need to handle well to produce an immersive, enjoyable experience. We're going to step through each of these cues in detail and explain how they're handled by an MR device like the HoloLens. But before we do that, it's important to know what hardware and software is available in an MR device like the HoloLens to reproduce these cues. 
Here we split the components into four main areas. The optics and acoustics area includes the see-through stereoscopic displays. In the hall lens, we have these additive light displays that add um, light to your see-through view of the real world. We also have speakers on the sides of the headbands that enable spatial sound, which we'll go into more detail about later. Our sensors include the IMU and environment understanding cameras that are crucial to tracking your position in the real world, the depth camera, microphones, and eye tracking cameras as well in the hall lens too. For human and environment understanding, there's the six degree of freedom or six stuff tracking system we use to know where the person is in their environment. And also spatial mapping that keeps track of the environment around you and all the surfaces. Uh, finally, there's input modalities that we use to provide um, control of the applications. There's gestural, like hand tracking, things like that, um, voice commands, as well as the option to use uh, controllers. So now I'll review all the cues that I brought up earlier, and we'll discuss why it's important in holographic experiences like RoboRaid to get them right. So let's start with the visual cues. And as we step through these cues, I'll show examples of them at play, as well as summaries of the key MR components involved in their accurate portrayal. And I'll show those at the, the bottom of the slide in those little boxes. So let's start with monocular cues. That is cues that are effective at conveying depth um, when they're only presented to one eye. They don't need both eyes to be viewing them. Um, and then we'll conclude with vergence and disparity, which are the main binocular cues we'll discuss today. So maybe the most fundamental visual cue to depth is occlusion. It's an unambiguous cue to depth ordering uh, relative to the observer. So for instance, when object A blocks your view of object B, you know that A must be closer than B. In this example, you can see the hologram on the left, that robot in front of the bookshelf. Since the, the robot is occluding the bookshelf, you know the robot must be closer to you than the bookshelf. So it's easy to make all holograms occlude the real world and have that ordering thanks to the additive see-through display on the HoloLens. But it's not so simple when you want a real world object to occlude a hologram. To render that correctly, your MR device needs to have awareness of your physical surroundings. For instance, consider a situation in RoboRaid where you'd like the robot to come out from behind the user's furniture and surprise them. In order to properly render the robot so that it's either completely or partially hidden by the furniture, we need a scan of the room, like this one provided by the onboard spatial mapping system. If we combine the scanned mesh with knowledge of where the user is looking, we can appropriately render the robot so that it appears to be occluded by the coffee table. So now here you can see the robot moving up and down and getting occluded and uh, disoccluded by the coffee table. Now, the, when we actually render this on the hall lens, of course, we wouldn't render all these green outline meshes. We would render all those meshes as solid black. And uh, since it's an additive light display, uh, the user wouldn't actually see those black textures. Instead, you'd just see the portions of the hologram um, being occluded or disoccluded. And if it's properly aligned with the real world, then it would give the illusion that it's moving up and down behind the coffee table. If we didn't have six stuff tracking and spatial mapping, the, re the robot would just be rendered over the coffee table. Um, and the occlusion cue, if anything, would indicate that it was closer than we intended. And if it's in conflict with other, other cues, then it could look very unnatural. Um, but note that this discussion is specific to MR devices like the HoloLens that embed digital content in your real surroundings. In VR, all of the content is digital, so you can simply rely on the rendering engine to properly handle occlusions. Then your perspective is another moniker cue that refers to how objects appear smaller, or at least they project to smaller regions on your eye or on a camera sensor as they get farther away. Another part of linear perspective related to this phenomenon of farther objects projecting to smaller sizes um, is a phenomenon that parallel lines in the real world when projected onto your retina or onto a camera sensor um, project to converging lines. Um, it's critical for the projections of digital content to behave the same as the real objects around you in order to maintain immersion. For instance, here's a case where we're trying to render a hole in the wall. We show that the parallel lines within that hole are converging to the same vanishing point as the parallel lines on the far wall. That's really important to make sure that the linear perspective is consistent both between the holograms and the real world. To do that rendering properly, we need to accurately calibrate the see-through displays and also have proper rendering calibration for the virtual cameras to make sure the projections are consistent with the real world environment.
Another monocular cue to depth is motion parallax. Motion parallax essentially refers to how closer objects seem to move more across our field of vision than distant objects as we move our heads. For instance, you can see this floating robot translate more across the field of view than the shelf as the camera shifts side to side. Along the same lines of reasoning, objects that are close together, like the portal and the wall in this instance, should appear to move the same amount as we move our heads side to side. In order to render all these things correctly, accurate head tracking is required, and this rule applies to VR as well. So here I have smooth and stable motion on this list of visual cues. It's more of a requirement to avoid unnatural visual behavior that breaks immersion than it is a proper depth cue, although it can disrupt depth cues. Um, so if the tracking is way off, like if there's inaccuracy in the tracker or lots of jitter in the IMU measurements, things like that, then the user's visual system can interpret the motion in unintentional ways. So for instance, um, as object motion, um, that was unintended. It can also result in the content appearing to be at unintended distances, with, which breaks immersion and provides the illusion that the uh, digital content is floating in different places in space instead of just locked to your world. Here you can see the result of jitter, which breaks the illusion that the portal is really solidly locked to the wall. Now here's an example of swim due to tracking inaccuracies or latency. This goes back to the motion parallax cue. Extra latency, specifically we're talking about, for instance, after you've taken a measurement of the head pose from the six soft tracker and then use that to render the scene and then send the pixels to the display and finally get the photons to the eye, that latency can add swim that unintentionally manifests as incorrect motion parallax. And then you can perceive the hologram as being at the incorrect distance. Beyond high accuracy tracking, uh, high render rates are also necessary to help avoid latency. For instance, we have always recommended for Holland's 1 and 2 to hit 60 frames per second as often as possible. Now, it'll always take a finite amount of time to estimate a head pose, render a scene, display the pixels on the, on the display, and, and get the photons into the eyes, the whole path. Therefore, any effective tra tracking system needs to incorporate a prediction algorithm so it can predict where the user's head will be, for instance, when the photons finally hit the eyes and, and render for that location. Uh, thankfully, the HoloLens and Windows MR devices have that tracking system built in, so the developer doesn't need to worry about predictive algorithms. All the cues we've covered so far have been monocular. That is, they only require one eye for them to be effective. The two binocular cues we'll cover now are vergence and disparity. Together, these cues allow stereopsis, which refers to how we perceive depth by comparing the differences between the images received by the two eyes. I'll review vergence and disparity quickly, and then we'll talk about their importance to holographic experiences. Vergence refers to the angle between the eyes lines of sight as one fixates on an object. As one looks close, as you can see in this diagram, the eyes lines of sight toe in and a larger vergence angle results. When the eyes look at infinity or objects very far away, the lines of sight become parallel and the angle between them approaches zero. The visual system can combine knowledge of the eye's virgin state with knowledge of how far apart the eyes are located relative to each other to triangulate the distance to an object. Note that while many of the monocular cues we've covered reveal the relative depth to objects, virgins can actually provide the absolute distance to an object. I should also mention here, the spacing between the eyes is often referred to as the interpupillary distance or IPD. Uh, technically speaking, it's probably more accurate to call it the interocular distance since that's fixed for a person and their interpupillary distance can technically change depending on whether you're verging close and the pupils are closer together or you're looking far away. But um, you'll probably hear the term IPD often and so we'll use that for the rest of our discussion here as well. So that was vergence. Meanwhile, disparity refers to the differences in the retinal projections of a scene due to the eyes being offset from each other. For instance, in this case, while the eyes are fixated on the blue star, the green star projects to the right of the blue star in the left eye and to the left of the blue star in the right eye. The difference between those projected positions between the two eyes is a disparity associated with that object. We illustrated those positions as X sub L and X sub R in these diagrams, and the associated disparity is just the difference between the two. Note that the disparity can be positive or negative depending on whether the object in question is closer or farther than where the eyes are currently po pointing in space. 
Now a lone disparity can reveal the depth ordering of different objects, but if it's combined with the vergence eye signals or other cues to absolute distance, it can also reveal the metric distance between two objects, not just the depth ordering between them. One thing that's crucial to get these cues correct though in mixed reality devices is to know the viewer's IPD. In fact, it's especially important in scenarios like RoboRaid, where you have virtual content that's supposed to be aligned with the real world. So consider this situation where we're trying to make a virtual alien portal appear to be embedded in the real wall. Here we diagrammatically show where the portal would need to be rendered on the left and right displays, in green and red respectively, so that if the user fixated their eyes on the portal, that is by having the right eye look at the red version there and the left eye look at the green version there, they would also be pointing at the surface of the wall, making the portal and wall appear to be coincidence. This diagram assumes the rendering engine knows the positions of the eyes relative to the displays, or at least the interpupillary distance. What well, if it didn't have access to those measurements and use the wrong values? Well, here on the right, we show the case where the user's IPD is underestimated. When the system renders for that incorrect IPD, the vergence and disparity cues indicate that the portal is floating off the plane of the wall, breaking the illusion. So instead it appears that the portal is too close to the user. If the user's IPD had been overestimated, the opposite error would have resulted and the user would have perceived the hologram as lying beyond the wall. While this example shows the static error introduced by incorrect IPD measurements, there are also implications for hologram stability if you get the IPD wrong. So here we still have the case where the IPD was underestimated, but now let's consider what happens as the user moves relative to the wall. You can see the depth error actually moves with the user. So not only is the hologram in the incorrect position, but it also appears to sway and swim as the user moves around, which completely breaks the illusion that it's locked to the real world. Hopefully these examples have convinced you of how important it is to get the user's IPD correct in Holland's applications with world-locked holograms. Holland's one required the user to go through a manual process to determine the user's IPD, but thankfully the eye tracking system in the Holland's two has made that process almost entirely automatic. Also, as far as VR is concerned, IPD is also important for accurate rendering and depth perception. However, it's easier to get away with errors in IPD estimates in VR because the errors apply to everything the user sees. Meanwhile, in MR devices like the HoloLens, the real world provides an obvious reference if you render depth incorrectly due to bad IPD measurements. Although I will emphasize in VR, just because it's harder to notice when you get the IPD wrong, it's still important to get it right for comfort reasons. I'd like to just take a quick aside to mention a visual phenomenon that is common to all commercially available VR, MR, AR headsets, also stereoscopic 3D displays, and that's the Virgins Accommodation Conflict, or VA Conflict, or VAC. We already know what Virgins is. Accommodation is basically just the process of focusing your eyes on an object to make it appear sharper. In natural viewing, as we look at objects in our environments, our eyes' Virgins and accommodative states are nearly always the same. Your eyes verge to make the object look single and not appear double, and they accommodate to make it appear sharp and not blurry. In fact, vergence and accommodation are so tightly coupled that they can drive one another. For instance, if you covered one eye and then looked at an object near and far, the accommodative signal would be enough to drive the vergence state of your other eye and make it turn in to track the object that it can't even see. Now that coupling varies, the strength of that coupling varies between people in the population. Uh, the important thing to note though is that the coupling is disrupted in currently available stereoscopic displays. In all currently available VR headsets, for instance, the light from the displays always originates from one distance, the focal plane of, of the display. To keep the imagery sharp as we look around the scene, our eyes have to stay accommodated to that single focal plane regardless of whether the binocular cues are guiding our eyes to verge near or far. So we can verge at the focal plane, but we can also verge at infinity or closer to ourselves in the, fo the focal plane. And this decoupling can cause discomfort for some users. And the amount of discomfort is dependent on the difference between the, where the eyes are accommodating and where they're verging, or the VAC. There's a great deal of literature on the topic, including the references I have listed here. For more information about the VA conflict, you can also get tips on how to avoid it in our developer guidelines. 
returning to our discussion of perceptual cues, our sense of hearing is central to maintaining awareness of our surroundings, especially outside our field of view. It's also important for processes like material perception, but for now, let's concentrate on how we can use sound to expand awareness of digital content all around the user. So let's wrap up with spatial sound, which refers to the set of aural cues that indicate distance and direction. In natural environments, we can localize the direction and distance to sound sources all around us, to the left, to the right, in front, behind, above, and below. Our goal in mixed reality headsets, that includes both Windows mixed reality VR headsets and the HoloLens, is to recreate those aural cues to give awareness of digital content placed anywhere around the environment. To do that, we simulate a typical HRTF or head-related transfer function. Now let's step through the information contained in the HRTF. Let's use this sound source as an example. It's to the person's left and it's above and in front of them. How does the HRTF convey the information to the user about the location of that object relative to their face? Since the sound is closer to one ear than the other, it will arrive at one ear sooner and sound louder to one ear. These relative timing and amplitude signals provide cues to the left-right position of the sound relative to the observer. In this case, the observer will be able to tell the sound is to his left based on the difference in timing and amplitudes. But timing and amplitude differences alone can't reveal whether the sound is in front or behind or above or below the person's head. That information is contained in how a sound spectrum is modulated by our upper torsos, heads, and pinnae, or the outer ear. Sounds that enter the ear from above, behind, or in front of the observer will have their spectra modulated in unique ways that belie their direction of origin. The direction-dependent modulation is known as the head-related transfer function, or HRTF, which we previously mentioned. And it's unique to each user, though it's possible to derive averaged or optimized HRTFs that work for most people. In fact, that's what we use in Windows Spatial Sound. Head tracking unlocks the potential of HRTF, though. If you consider just using HRTF while using headphones at a computer monitor, you can get some sense of 3D direction just from the HRTF alone. But once you add head movement, you can hear how the spectrum changes with the HRTF as your head moves relative to the sound source, and it allows you to localize the sound much more accurately. You can also, of course, apply other effects to make sounds appear to be emanating from different environments like echoey caves or intimate office spaces. And you can either use that in the hall lens to make it seem like the sound is coming from your real environment, or you can also use it in VR environments, of course, to make it sound like it's coming from different fantastical locations. By combining these direction and distance cues, we are able to convince the user that a sound is emanating from a specific location in their environment. When you have holograms that emit sound, Properly simulating the HRTF is crucial to making the hologram feel like it's part of your environment. Otherwise, the sound will seem like it's disconnected from the hologram and break the illusion. It's also useful to bring your attention to holograms that are outside the device's field of view. Even in natural viewing, we can't see all the way around ourselves, so sound gives us cues to objects behind us. We can use that same phenomenon to bring the user's attention to holograms that are behind us that we can't render. That wraps up our discussion of the visual and aural cues that go into convincing and compelling MR experiences and the technologies we use to simulate them. Our case study was centered on a game, but I do want to leave you with a reminder that these cues are also super important to our commercial mixed reality applications. For instance, when our customers are stepping through holographic guides or using remote assist to perform complex repairs under the guidance of a remote expert, the ability to accurately render holograms so they appear over the intended location and direct the users to the right parts is crucial to their success. Thank you for your time.